Hello and welcome to Bloomberg Quint. We are watching the fine print. Lack of transparency, unscrupulous transactions, multiple taxes and prices that sometimes defy the law of gravity. I am referring to the real estate sector and all these attributes uh, uh, can be attributed to the realty sector and now we have the new indirect tax regime that is GST just 24 days away. So will this new indirect tax regime solve some of these or all of these issues that plague the realty sector. To answer that, I have with me on the GST countdown today, Niranjan Hiranandani, co-founder and managing director of the Hiranandani Group. So welcome to the show and thank you for joining us in the fine print. Pleasure. I'm going to just cut to the chase and you know, not indulge in any build up. We have the 12% rate for the realty sector and that is inclusive of the value of the land and, we'll, and you will get full input tax credit on it. What will it mean for prices uh, and what will it mean for home buyers in the GST regime? I think there are three aspects of it. The first aspect of it is the transition phase. So we say moving from one end to the other. The second is the fact that there are properties which have already been sold and we have already paid 1% back. And the third part of it will be the future, which will be development, which will take subsequently. So let's take them step by one and understand the impact. Yeah. So the first one, if you say that you have already paid VAT, unfortunately, uh, the issue looks very complex in the sense that the tax will be levyable for those amounts which are not paid later on. And a higher rate of tax is definitely applicable, which is 12% on the balance amount of payment. But you will get input credit as far as uh, the inputs which have been put into the uh, project. So that's something which is going to be available to you in okay. terms if of I a set up. So for instance, if I have brought a, a property in January this year, yeah. so far I was paying what? Four or one percent back. One percent and then uh, of course the stamp duty and registration that remains almost yeah. the same. Correct. Uh, for this period, of course, I'm not getting any input tax credit. Tomorrow, no. uh, I mean 24 days from now, July 1 uh, deadline, we I paid 12% tax. Yes, but you get an input credit of that. You get the input, input credit, credit of that. But so, I am but the home buyer, how do I benefit from? But that's that's the problem, and I think the transition phase is not too clear that uh, how this will happen and what is the extent to which the input credit will be available because all those things are not yet documented in the manner in which GST will give the input credit. So I think uh, the transition phase is certainly requires clarification, especially in respect of the land component. Earlier, whenever the credit was given, the land component was not taxed at all. And hence we get this there. Uh, what has happened is earlier almost 50% uh, or 45 to 50% set off was allowed under that. And just now we, there is a question. To the abatement. abatement part. So that part of it now looks confusing and it is appearing that it may be reduced, which means the land component will be shown as a smaller amount, which in the Mumbai region or high priced areas or uh, expensive properties would mean that the abatement would be much lower. And that's a challenge which I think uh, we will have to face in terms of the transition phase. Okay, so explain the maths to me uh, if the abatement sort of reduces, uh, give me a picture of before and after. Actually that's not very clear because we still don't have the final thing of the extent of abatement that they are talking about. So working out a calculation is not really feasible at this point of time unless we get those figures finally uh, nobody knows so that's a question mark as far as we are concerned and we are hoping that that clarification should be issued in the next couple of days and I believe 11th is the last day for the meeting and probably it will come into that part of the meeting. Uh, having said that uh, uh, the in the future the abatement and other things in terms of affordable housing would be definitely benefited because the land cost would be lower in the areas where affordable housing is taking place and the abatement and set off, I'm sorry, the set off would be sufficiently to cover all the other issues and hence uh, there is likelihood of the overall taxes remaining approximately the same as it was earlier. But in the case of higher price properties, I think the challenge will be that uh, uh, the costing will go up. So the cost to the end customer would actually be higher. So in the future, 
uh, the other housing part of it looks like is going to be more expensive. Okay, I want to go back to your point which you said that the transition period is not clear. So one clarity that we are awaiting is that if I'm already invested in a property and I continue to pay installments on it, until June 30th, I'm going to be paying 1% one, 1 VAT, but I don't know the installment that I For the balance pay. afterwards. For the balance <laughs> afterwards, whether the incidence of tax will be 12% and whether the developers will be able to even pass on that benefit to the consumers because that should convert into a lesser EMI uh, compared to a pre-GST regime. Exactly. Right. So I think that part of it is still unclear. Okay. All right. Uh, you talked about the affordable housing segment, right? Um, break it down for me, sir. What parts of or like, you know, what levels of properties will benefit from uh, probably or probably will see reduced prices? Uh, in, in the whole uh, real estate sector. I think basically if uh, the inputs of materials as far as that is concerned of labor and materials is high, then the input tax credit which will be available in the case of affordable housing because then construction cost in material will be a higher percentage of total cost. Then there will definitely be a clear cut benefit because input tax credit will be much higher availability to set it off. And, uh, but uh, are you allowed the, the, the refund of overflow? Or? No, we are not allowed the overflow, but at okay. least the set off is permitted. Okay. So to a greater extent, we think because the tax on goods uh, on the contracts and other things comes to 18 okay. percent. So ultimately, you have to understand input and other things which are taking place uh, will be quite high in the case of affordable housing. So, of course, each project will be uh, having a different uh, cost, uh, costing ratio as well as the benefit of input tax. But I think overall, if I just make rough numbers, uh, we should see a little better uh, terms in terms of costing in the affordable housing segment. But even middle class housing appears to me will be costing higher in terms of the post GST regime. Because uh, the overall costing uh, credit that we are looking at in terms of it, I mean, even if you take uh, reasonable costing in terms of Mumbai region or the MMR region, the land cost is definitely higher as far as the rest of the, as compared to the rest of the country. So that set off to the extent which they are talking about is much lower than what is presently available. So the currently my outgo on tax is about what, 9 to 11% weighed yes. on state-wise yes. uh, yes. state and now we have a unified rate of 12% yes. with you know input tax credit available to developers. And stamp duty will still continue. Fully. So stamp duty and registration. In fact, stamp duty may go up by 1%. There's a question of uh, trying to commute the value in terms of the octroi and other things to make it into that 1% to be added. So that's also something which is likely to come up. Okay, so stamp duty and registration costs remain as is and from 9 to 11% now the GST rate is 12% but of course that benefit of input tax credit will be passed on. Um, here, uh, you know, there is an assumption like, you know, when you hear things like, oh, you know, this credit will be available to developers because your main components which is for instance steel and cement in the sector you will get input tax credit on those components. Um, there is a you know anti-profiteering committee that will sit in judgment of whether the benefit of of this provision gets passed on to the customers. How will the real estate sector and how will you as a group deal with that? Uh, no, I don't see assessment? I don't see a problem in relating to that because the transparency after RERA is quite overt and all the cost other inputs in terms of what is the projected cost, what are the taxation, all will be transparently put on the websites. So I don't think there will be a problem in terms of uh, what is the benefit available to the developer in terms of input tax credit and other thing. I think it will be totally transparent and certified from the chartered accountants and so on and so forth. I don't think that will be really a problem. But the problem is, is it ultimately going to cost you more or not depending on the state and the benefit in terms of uh, input tax credit and the set off against land mm -hmm. is a question mark till today in my mind and uh, I, so I would see I would say I would see clarity on that in order to see what is the real final benefit to the end customer in terms of input tax credit and especially in the transition mode. Okay, so assuming that the abatement part doesn't come in, how does that, how does the math look then? Uh, for, the, for the people who have already purchased it, obviously there's going to be an additional tax 
which was not envisaged when he bought the property. Right. So that part of it is definitely an additional tax which he didn't envisage. At least prospectively he, will, he or she will know what is going to be the additional tax and when he buys the property. But because the transition pays, the tax comes in subsequently and there is a tax to it where we don't get the benefit of the credit to the extent that we used to get before. It's bound to be uh, uh, onerous to the purchase. Okay, I'm going to put you in a difficult position here, sir. So somebody who's made up today his or her mind that I want to purchase a property, would you advise that person to hold on to that purchase for the next 24 days? No, I don't think so. You see, what has happened is that because of the confusion, the opportunities available to the buyer is so many higher. And uh, what I really do find is that uh, uh, when the markets are uh, shaken or when the markets are depressed, that's the right time to buy an apartment. Uh, if people tend to buy it only in boom times, which is good for the developer. But if you're asking it from a customer's viewpoint, obviously when the markets are sluggish, they get better options from the developer, they get better terms and they get, uh, you know, better options no, available. I, I so I don't think, uh, I don't think postponement is a good idea, though uh, it uh, ultimately will bring clarity both to the purchaser as well as the developer in terms of doing it exactly. and putting it on the table. Exactly, because I ask this because several uh, issues that you pointed out, whether it's terms of the abatement. But the lots of people are buying just because they want to do it before that. Oh really? Oh and, yes. And the logic for that is? The logic is that they do feel that the pre-transition, whatever the amount paid, will not get uh, stuck into the higher rates of duty subsequently. So a lot of people are paying the deposits and taking uh, properties before that and day and closing deals also in terms of finished properties trying to close it even before uh, the end of the month. The indication looks like then that 24 days people need to hurry up with that buying decision. Well it it's not everybody has the capability of buying and uh, but those people who want to buy right. and are sitting on the fence a large number of people are closing the deals because they say okay if it's one month later God knows what is the additional tax in terms of the whole position. So I think that that part of it is certainly happening. Understood. Um, uh, you referred to it uh, earlier uh, briefly sir that because of the input tax credit um, the, the businesses will want to then work with registered vendors etc right. The cash component in real estate transactions that was you know a, a huge part of it so far. Uh, do you see that come down or will people still figure out ways uh, see, to get around this? See, in the Mumbai region, you must know, 90% of the people have been borrowing monies from the banks and financial institutions. So the full check business has been going on for a pretty long period of time. And I don't think uh, many people want, have been paying cash, etc. Maybe a small minority somewhere here and there. But by and large, if you see 90% of the properties are going on a full check basis because they're getting loans and financial institutions and loans at a very lower rate of interest than what you used to get a couple of years ago. So having said that, I think that cash component is a is a yesterday story. For Mumbai, so I, but you wouldn't deny that for you know, for instance, tier two towns or, or yes, the NCR it is, region, it is, right? it is, it is, and uh, many cases, uh, what you're saying is true. But I think, by and large, that will definitely, uh, especially after demonetization, has taken a hit. So I think uh, there is a problem in those areas where people are habituated to pay cash. As far as that is concerned, I think that story is going to slowly, slowly die off. And second, whatever you do in them, the benefit of input tax credit and other things which are there are not going to come to you. So that part of it is certainly going to be a new sure, story. I think this might be a far-fetched sort of uh, question, but because now the cash transactions, as you say, uh, would likely come down or the propensity of doing a cash transaction will come down, will that have an impact on prices? Because from what I understand, if you're, you're doing a cash transaction, you, I think, get, end up getting a better deal, right? See, I'll tell you, the affordable housing segment is definitely moving up, especially because of the tax benefits, because of the other benefits in terms of interest subvention, all these things have made a world of a difference. So you are going to see huge amount of growth in the affordable housing segment whether it's tier one tier two or tier three cities that's a certainty having said that i think the growth story in terms of what's happening at the higher cost element is something which we will have to see in terms of clarification that is coming so what the prime minister wants in terms of creating affordable housing stock and creating housing for all 
in 2022 is certainly move, will move faster. I am not saying that they will be able to meet that deadline, but certainly I think the growth story in that segment is going to grow. So a lot more housing will get into uh, the affordable housing segment in the next couple of years. However, land prices and taxes have all gone up. Mumbai, local taxes, uh, FSI cost, uh, ready reckoner rates, uh, the uh, costing in terms of land under construction, the principal taxes and other things have certainly shot up. All these also required to be rationalized. And second, I wish they had integrated GST with stamp duty and all the other taxes also, because then it could have been one Seamless, payment yeah. and you know all this confusion you pay this you pay that you pay the local municipal taxes you're paying deposits so what was the logic of not uh, including that i think the states wanted a kind of freedom in that segment as far as that is concerned but having said that i thought that this was an area where there was an opportunity to actually correlate everything to come into one position that's not happened now that's an uh, it's a gone story as far as we are concerned. We would have been extremely happy if it had been one window clears all. But that's not happened and you know. Okay. Uh, let me come to the rentals part of it, sir. The rentals from residential spaces will not come under GST, but rentals from commercial uh, spaces will uh, be part or will uh, you know attract GST. How does that compare to the existing scenario? Uh, I haven't really studied that in depth as far as that is concerned, but I, I believe there is some small incremental amount which will be payable by the commercial segments, but I can stand corrected on that. All right, okay. Um, help me understand that um, currently the, the sale of completed projects uh, will not attract GST, right? right. Uh, so that segment will continue to attract what? 4.55% uh, yes. of, of tax yes, net Yes, yes, 5 5% actually. 5%. Uh, so if I am a buyer who has the option of looking at a completed project versus an under construction project, uh, would you advise me to choose the former over the latter just from the tax point of view? The answer is yes, obviously, because then you have further clarity in terms of payment. You, I would buy a completed property with occupation certificate, would certainly make a lot of difference. And it also res removes the risk profile completely in terms of a buy. So yes. Okay, so both from the from the risk and the tax point of yes. view, a, a constructed property will serve better. Yeah. Um, one uh, sort of question that I had is that why do you think then that the constructed property space or the, uh, the, the completed project space has not been included in GST? See, the point is very simple that uh, earlier that even the under construction properties were not to be included. It was some high court in Bangalore in uh, Karnataka which gave a judgment that under construction could be taxed. Originally, no government and anybody had an intention to really tax this segment. But because one high court gave that judgment and later on other high courts followed that uh, route, that they real thought that even properties under construction could come into the tax net. So that just continued and since government wants to pick up resources from all possible segments, especially real estate, it became a very highly taxed arena. But there was no positive intent earlier for, for uh, uh, you know, housing or real estate to be taxed because it was considered immovable property. But somehow or the other, one high court decision led to another and governments were very happy with that decision and ultimately uh, we've become extremely taxed for under construction properties. Would you foresee that uh, the constructed or the completed projects, I mean, going forth can also come under the GST net and would you want No, to it is legally not tenable. Okay, all right. Yeah. Uh, uh, the the one uh, area where you know, especially the SMEs are struggling, is the technology uh, uh, technology process of coming on to the GSTN and changing their processes, etc. Uh, how is your preparedness in the technology front uh, when it comes to GST? My IT people and people say we are ready. I hope they are. <laughs> Okay. Of course, it's a challenge. Whenever you do any transition to new things and you look at IT processes, obviously the challenge of the uh, issues at the time of start are going to be there. But we all solve the problem over a period of time, sometimes five days, sometimes 50 days, sometimes 500 days. But uh, I think these are now much easily solved 
because uh, uh, the whole country is working towards it. So, I am sure we will be able to find solutions faster than we used to do in the past. Glitches you are bound to have, problems you are bound to have, hiccups you are bound to have, but that is only a passing phase. Have your vendors or your suppliers uh, sort of told you of any challenges that they are in particular phases and how are you sort of dealing with that? <laughs> everybody is too confused okay. actually it's only when you start walking the talk that you really will see something happening uh, but I don't think that uh, it will be too much of a problem or too long a wait I think in a couple of weeks maybe everything will fall into place uh, we will need clarification from the government from time to time in order to do which would be helpful in terms of doing it but I think uh, industry wide there is a uh, little issues of tension especially on the transition Sure. On the point of clarification, uh, one last question on GST. Do you see any specific areas where the industry needs uh, sort of clarifications uh, from the government? I think this uh, set off and uh, issues that need uh, abatement and set off really is a challenge. And I think if they clarify that in terms of at least that in favor of the customer, I think it will be very beneficial. Because you said, sir, that you would like the clarification to be in the favor of customer, I cannot not talk to you about RERA, which is another sort of major reform that we have finally seen in the real estate sector. And it, you know, breaks a consumer's heart to then see where are states diluting the RERA rules that, you know, uh, we have the model RERA law and the rules and then we have each state coming out with its own set of rules. And there's a group fight for RERA that has written a lengthy letter to the, to the government and to the Prime Minister, specifically for my Maharashtra uh, sort of specifying the rules that have been diluted uh, and if I can sort of name them for the benefit of our viewers is that you know the fine table or the terms for compounding of offence that has been diluted you were supposed to register a project uh, with, with a final sanction plan that has been allowed to be uh, to be done with the proposed FSI consumption, number of floors, etc. Diversion of funds, uh, where you know you were supposed to keep 70% of the funds into escrow. Now 70% of future receivables will be kept in escrow. And same for you know there are a variety of definitions in state to state for ongoing project. How do you see uh, this law help the benefit the consumer in any fashion if this is the way states are going to go? I don't see any problem. Really, what you're saying is the transition period. So the issue is of transition period of what happened before the law came into force and what monies were received by the developers before the transfer took place. No, if that is not taken into consideration, my view is it's a very, very tough law. So I don't think the consumer need to worry whatsoever in terms of it, especially in Maharashtra. The law is extremely tough, it is pro-consumer and there is no issue whatsoever in terms of that law. We have a very, very strong pro-consumer regulator who is extremely tough. In fact, he has issued one order against uh, one of the uh, uh, already. Uh, agents already and it's, it's come very, very fast and he has passed an order in 48 hours. I mean, it's unbelievable. So, I don't think the consumers in Maharashtra need to worry whatsoever. Yes, there is a problem of the transition space. So if developers have already done the transaction and those projects which are ongoing, the impounding of money is relating to prospectively. There's no way to dream about how to get back monies in terms of ongoing projects if their deficiency has been already diverted. And that's always going to be a challenge. I mean, if you want to go retrospective in all the projects, uh, India is not going to move and there is no way by which projects will really uh, get off the ground. But remember one thing, prospectively, there's a 500% security for the buyer but how and it works perfectly. All this bullshit that it has been divert, diluted is not true no, but, at all. But it's not so, true. So it's not true. The inter that you, you, you uh, registered a final pro uh, sanction plan no, it's versus a, it, a proposed one. Do you not see that as a dilution? No, it is not. Because suppose I have a pro project of 500 acres. I'm developing only 50 acres. Obviously, I'm going to make changes into the project for the rest of the areas. The phase of which is done is to be final, which I'm selling today. So what the interpretation has gone that you're making changes? The answer is no. Suppose out of 500 acres of land, I'm developing only 20 acres or 10 acres. Then I, ca I have to have the flexibility to develop the 490 acres that I'm doing in the manner in which I decide to do so. So what is interpreted is 
that you can make those changes. That's not true where the future development is there. So I don't think the rules and regulations are any way close to saying they are pro developer. They are realistic because that's how development works. But yes, the transition period is a difficult period where we will see some places where the regulator may not be able to do anything much as much as he would like to do. But remember, ongoing schemes are also required to have a defined timeline which they are supposed to put into the regulator phase and those also are going to cause a lot of difficulty to the developers as a community and it's not easy. In fact, they are the ones who are worried uh, more than the consumers are at this present point of time. So I don't see this as a problem but yes, you're right. Many of the transition schemes difficulty will continue but at least prospectively any person who comes into newer projects or are buying fresh, they can be 100% secured about their purchase. Well, that's the word uh, we'll hold you to. Uh, of course, sir, of course, in the post of course, of course, of course, of course. Thank you so much. There will, be, there will be criminals and murderers, but that's there in every society, even though you have hanging and death sentences. But I can tell you that uh, you will see a substantial amount of transparency and openness to be done. And certainly there will be consolidation also because you won't find every Tom, Dick and Harry who has no money whatsoever to be able to get into the real estate field, which was happening yesterday. So I think a lot of improvement will take place. I don't think that's really a challenge. But yes, I agree. During the transitions period, there are gray areas which really uh, need to be closed and they will be closed. But to say that this is a pro-developer uh, kind of regulation which is taken is nonsensical and untrue. Well, here is hoping to that improvement and thank you, Mr. Hiranandai. Thank you for joining us on Bloomberg Quint and the Fine Print, and thank you so much for watching. Thank you.